My name is David Jones. I'm the Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine uh, here at Harvard University, and especially here in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And it's a great pleasure to let, welcome you all to our 2023 Roger Allen Moore Lecture at Harvard Medical School. First given in 1992, the lecture honors the memory of Roger Allen Moore, and we're very happy to have our members of his family here joining us today. He was a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, and had a very distinguished career in Boston, working both at the Ropes and Gray Law Firm, and also was a long-term advisor to the Harvard Teaching Hospitals, to Harvard Medical School and its hospitals, for instance, helping to run the Risk Management Foundation that manages, that oversees the insurance programs that these hospitals use for their physicians. And as I said, I'd like to welcome the Moore family and their friends for making these talks possible uh, now for these many years. So we had to put this program on hold for several years during COVID. The last lecture, some of you remember, was in 2019 by Warwick Anderson, because we felt that an important part of these lectures was the opportunity to be together in person and to have conversation before, during, and after these talks. And we did not think that would translate well to Zoom. Uh, of course, that happened at the cost of having to have a several year hiatus uh, in these programs. And as we've gotten people back, of course, we're only partially successful in getting everyone comfortable in in-person events. I'm delighted to see this crowd here, and we have an equally loud crowd who's watching on Zoom. Uh, and so we will do our best to monitor the Q&A to make sure that the people who have joined us on Zoom will also be able to be part of the conversation that will follow the talk. Now, these lectures, as envisioned, have had a very broad mandate to take up questions of value and medicine. And the details of the lecture have varied a lot according to the interests and expertise of the lecturer. And over these now 30 years that we've been doing these talks, we've had people from a wide range of fields, uh, from in medicine and anthropology and history, philosophy. We've had writers, including William Styron. We've had economists, including Amartya Sen. And we've even had Supreme Court justices. In 2008, we had the good fortune to have Stephen Breyer uh, here as our speaker. And our speaker today can, can stand proudly amongst this distinguished lineage of past speakers. Dorothy Roberts re received her bachelor's degree at Yale and then came to Harvard uh, where she received her JD from Harvard Law School. She spent a long stretch of her career at the University of Pennsylvania, where as you can see here, she has a very distinguished and long collection of titles uh, in service of the university there. Her scholarship has moved fluidly between the areas of law, sociology, and history, and different people will describe her differently, will claim her work differently depending on what field they happen to be in, which I think is a sign of very successful interdisciplinary research. She's one of the leading scholars of all things race in America, uh, and unfortunately that is a gargantuan topic of ongoing importance for all of us, especially these intersections between race and science, which makes her work of particular interest to many of us here. She's the author of over 100 scholarly articles and several books. Uh, her first book, 1997, Killing the Black Body, was an examination of race and reproduction in the United States. And that was the introduction for many people for her work. But since that time, she's worked on the child welfare system. In 2011, her book, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Came to Recreate Race in the 21st Century, has been hugely influential in many areas of scholarship in science studies, in race studies, and far beyond. I first met Dorothy in 2006 when she joined a conference I organized at MIT at the time about race and medical technology. <clears throat> and for those of us who were there, I think will continue to will still describe this as one of the most exciting conferences they have ever been to, not because of anything that we had done as scholars and academics. We were interested in the challenge poised by, posed by the drug Bidel which was the one and only time the FDA has ever approved a drug specifically for a race specific indication. In this case, the treatment of heart failure in people who self-identify as black. And that was the language that they used for this cumbersome thing. But it turned out Bidel was marketed by a company based in Lexington, Massachusetts, not too far away from us. And little did we know at the time, but the conference was infiltrated really by a series of secret agents from the company. And I mean that literally. These were people who were on the payroll of the company or had received grants from the company, but had presented themselves as something completely other than that. And so they showed up en masse and were repeatedly disruptive all the way through. Uh, and it was only two years later, courtesy of the work of an investigative journalist at Wall Street Journal, that we put all the pieces of the puzzle together over who these people were and what they actually represented. Uh, 
but it was exciting times. One of them accused me of trying to kill black people uh, <laughs> because we were casting doubt on this drug that he supported as did his financial patrons. Um, but the, the, the moment that stood out for a lot of people is when the regional director of the NAACP, someone with substantial social capital, you'd think talking about race in America, got up to say, I don't know why any of you are having this conversation. The NAACP has endorsed this drug. So there's nothing left that needs to be said. At which point Dorothy Roberts got up and said, you don't speak for all black people. I do not support this drug and here's why. Uh, but then Troy Duster, who was also in the audience, uh, joined Dorothy, and it was an incredibly interesting and brave uh, act of scholars who are studying up for the con convictions uh, in the face of this opposition that turns out uh, prompted by this pharmaceutical company. And she has remained active in many years since then uh, <clears throat> on all things related to race and science, a frequent commentator, frequently interviewed, was one of the people, one of the scholars focused, uh, featured in the 1619 project, and so you can see her work there as well. Um, but in some respects, it was her recent, recent events have pulled her back towards some of the original work. She's a scholar at a law school and can't help but have been struck last June when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Uh, and that made her work from decades ago on race and reproduction in the country dramatically and newly relevant. Uh, even though many people have framed abortion as a woman's rights issue historically, it has been an issue of race justice and reproductive justice in many ways. Women in this country who are black and brown have long been overrepresented in the category of people who have felt the need to resort to a pregnancy termination. And so now that the Supreme Court has turned this decision back to the states, and many states, have you seen, have, as you have seen, have been busily recriminalizing uh, abortion, this will have a differential impact on the lives of black and brown people in this country. And so I'm very eager to hear her latest thoughts on what is happening and what will happen as this continues to play out. And so Dorothy will give her remarks and then we will have an initial response uh, by Carmel Shakar, uh, who is joining us. She is the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center at Harvard Law School, uh, where she is also a lecturer. The Petrie Flom Center uh, hosts conversations at the law school on health law, policy, biotechnology, bioethics, uh, very much kindred spirits in the kind of work that we do here in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Her own teaching and research have explored many areas on public health ethics and law, on the management of vulnerable populations. So I'm eager to hear what Carmel has to say in response to Dorothy. And then we will open it up for a Q&A with all of you and for the people on Zoom uh, once we're finished. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dorothy. Thanks so much for that introduction and uh, that trip down memory lane. <laughs> David and I do go back a long way. He left out some of the encounters we've had with, <laughs> I won't mention them all, uh, with people who want to insist that race is a biological category and deny our common humanity. Uh, but I've always been very grateful, David, for your support. And thank you so much for the invitation to give this very prestigious lecture. I'm really honored to give it. Uh, thanks to the Moore family uh, for their support and the Petrie Flom Center as well. I look forward to Carmel's uh, thoughts after I finish my lecture. And thanks to all of you for coming in person, uh, despite the option to be remote, but I also am grateful for all who are joining remotely. So I am especially happy to give a lecture dedicated to interrogating values in medicine, which I've devoted a lot of my work to doing. And the value I want to interrogate in my lecture today is justice and specifically reproductive justice with special attention to the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. The Dobbs decision is absolutely stunning in its devaluation of reproductive freedom. It's not only that the court overturned Roe versus Wade, 
holding that the US Constitution doesn't provide any right to abortion, but also how dismissive the court is of the actual lives of women and other pregnant people seeking an abortion. Justice Alito's majority opinion downplays or completely ignores the consequences of compelled pregnancy and the denial of autonomy over one's body and childbearing. At the end of the opinion, after stating that states need only show a rational basis and those law students and law professors will know that that's the lowest uh, standard for review. The court considers only the state's interest in fetal life and says that that's sufficient to overcome any interest in reproductive freedom and enough to force a pregnant person to give birth. There's not even a consideration of the interests on the other side. As a result, about half of states have banned or poised to outlaw abortion, some with explicitly or effectively no exceptions at all. Dobbs has divided the nation into free states and states that can compel birth. Nearly one third of women live in one of those unfree states where abortion is either criminalized or so restricted that it's effectively unavailable to many of them. And the same rationale that the court used for overturning Roe versus Wade and the right to abortion would overturn other freedoms, other freedoms that weren't recognized by white male elites in the 19th century, which is the standard that the court basically used to determine what freedoms were protected by the constitution. Clarence Thomas, of course, in his concurrence lists freedoms uh, like the freedom to marry uh, and other freedoms that are now in jeopardy. Those are the unfathomable repercussions of the Dobbs decision. But to understand the full scope of the court's devaluation of reproductive freedom, I think we have to ask whether the court protected reproductive freedom before Dobbs. And here it helps to focus on the experiences of Black women. There's a long history of punishing Black women for having children including mass sterilization abuse, pregnancy-related prosecutions, harsh welfare regulation, and state child removal. Roe versus Wade was a victory for the narrow protection against state laws criminalizing abortion, but it failed to recognize the full scope of reproductive freedom, leaving in place these other forms of reproductive control. For most of its history, the mainstream reproductive rights movement also centered its advocacy on safeguarding the constitutional right to abortion and didn't pay much attention to these other forms of reproductive violence. This focus prioritized the interests of the most privileged people in the nation and obscured the experiences of black, brown, indigenous, and other marginalized women whose childbearing was socially devalued. As Nicole Moore wrote just a few days ago in HuffPost, I used to say Roe was the ground floor of reproductive rights. In retrospect, it was a penthouse built for those privileged and able-bodied enough to make it up to the lofty entrance. So in this lecture, I want to draw together my work over the last three decades, spotlighting the devaluation of black women's childbearing, the criminalization of pregnancy itself, and my most recent scholarship and activism on state compelled family separation. The Dobbs decision makes plainer than ever the entanglement of all of these forms of reproductive injustice. After Dobbs, we can see more clearly a right-wing strategy of reproductive control that includes not only abortion laws, 
that compel pregnant people to give birth, but also a broader criminalization of people who give birth to raise and uh, criminalization of people who give birth and criminalization of raising children. Especially telling is how the court's attention to adoption ties together these forms of reproductive oppression. Justice Alito's majority opinion refers favorably to relinquishing babies for adoption as an answer to denying access to abortion. Its rosy recommendation of adoption paints a false picture of both reproductive servitude and its history and the child welfare system's current operation. The court ignores how forced reproductive labor, forced family separation, and enslavers authority over enslaved families were entwined during the slavery era, as well as opposed by the abolitionists who drafted the 14th Amendment. So the court also has a flawed view of the 14th Amendment. Uh, it ignores the importance of ending reproductive servitude and family separation that were animating reasons for enacting the 14th Amendment. Now, even its originalism is wrong. Right? I want to bring those violent entanglements and the continuing struggle to abolish them to the forefront. Okay. The connection between abortion bans and family separation has its roots in the institution of chattel slavery. Exploitation of women's reproductive labor entailed enslavers' domination of both childbearing and child rearing. Let's consider the violence inflicted on Black women by compelling their pregnancies under bondage to examine the violence inflicted on pregnant people today by compelling them to give birth under abortion laws. Because enslavers had a vital economic stake in Black women's childbearing, they made control of reproduction a central aspect of the slavery regime. And slavers claimed a property right in enslaved women's bodies and enslaved women's children from the moment of conception. A 1662 law passed by the Virginia Assembly giving the children born to black women and fathered by white men the status of their mothers permitted white men to profit from raping enslaved women by enslaving any children who resulted. And here, maybe uh, since there's a lot packed into that, because I think the way in which the, these uh, colonizers, the colonial uh, governments decided the status of, the ch of children born to black women, but fathered by white men, determining that they would have the status of their mothers and therefore be enslavable, uh, that that relates to the very invention of race, the idea that race is reproduced and that black women can only have black children. Uh, that is complicated. I'm not gonna get into it in this lecture, but I will put a plug for the 1619 project docu-series, which is dropping, as they say, tonight. And yeah. my chapter on race is going to be the focus of episode two. Okay, so enslavers' legal control over Black women's reproductive capacity and the law's failure to give enslaved women any legal right to bodily autonomy cast an archetype for laws that compel pregnant people to give birth. Where is the precedent for appropriation of a person's body by the state? Where did we learn in this country that the state could define a fetus as a distinct matter of law and property and state intervention? Uh, that's a question asked by historian Jennifer Morgan. We learned that from the long and violent history of hereditary racial slavery. And I, began my book, Killing the Black Body, with 
the example of enslavers punishing pregnant enslaved women by making them lie down on the ground where a hole had been dug for their bellies so they could protect their property interest in the fetus while they were punishing the black woman. So we have this precedent all the way back to the slavery era of thinking of the fetus as property that uh, can be controlled and identified apart from the pregnant person uh, who is gestating the fetus. Although there are obvious differences between exploiting the reproductive labor of enslaved women and banning abortion, there's also a profound resemblance in the denial of autonomy caused by compelled pregnancy. And I think that's how we should think about the nature of abortion bans. Family separation was also inextricably tied to reproductive servitude. One of the most awful atrocities inflicted by the slavery regime was the physical separation of enslaved parents from their children. And slavers had absolute discretion to buy and sell family members separately from each other. They could dismember black families at will for whatever reason. A 19th century South Carolina court noted, for example, that planters could sell children away from their mothers no matter how young, because, quote, the young of slaves stand on the same footing as other animals. Only Louisiana and in 1852, Alabama enacted laws that placed any restrictions at all on the ages at which children could be sold separately from their parents. According to historian Heather Andrea Williams, one of my colleagues in Africana at Penn, approximately one third of enslaved children in the Upper South experienced family separation in one of three possible scenarios, sale away from parents, sale with mother away from father, or sale of mother or father away from child. A slaveholder might decide to sell a mother, a father, or their children to pay off a debt or to punish perceived disobedience. Black people were devised in wills, wagered at horse races, and awarded in lawsuits. Bonded families were disbanded when the heirs of an estate decided not to continue the patriarch's business, or when young children were hired or apprenticed out to work on another plantation. And by the way, that continued after the Civil War when judges would declare black parents negligent at the petition of a white person who wanted to claim that child's labor and judges routinely would then send black children sometimes back to their very former enslavers to work for them, virtually re-enslaving them. We don't hear about that as much as we hear about the convict leasing system, uh, but it was also a form of ending reconstruction and re-enslaving black people, this, this time by taking the labor and uh, authority over black children. Enslaved women's loved ones routinely, in the words of Toni Morrison in Beloved, got rented out, loaned out, bought up, brought back, stored up, mortgaged, won, stolen, or seized. Nobody stopped playing checkers just because the pieces included their children. Even when enslaved families remained physically intact, black parents were denied authority over their children. Slavery law installed the white patriarch as head of the plantation family that included the black people he enslaved. While people, I'm sorry, white people considered the plantation family ruled by white men to be the best institution to teach moral values to Africans whom they deemed to be uncivilized. Abrogation of the parental bond was a hallmark of the civil death that the United States slavery imposed. Those are the words of Peggy Cooper Davis from her very important book, Neglected Stories, the Constitution and Family Values. 
Slaveholders proclaimed their moral authority by enforcing the message of parental helplessness, frequently whipping enslaved parents in front of their children. Likewise, enslavers had unbridled authority to force black children to labor, to punish them and to sexually assault them while denying enslaved parents any power to protect their children. Black mothers resisted reproductive servitude by self-inducing abortions, fending off enslavers' sexual violence and caring for their children. But their love for their children ironically gave enslavers a cruel advantage. Slaveholders could threaten enslaved women who were rebellious with the sale of their children to make them more compliant. And slavers used children as hostages to prevent bonded women from running away or to lure escaped women back to plantations. This strategy is one of the reasons far fewer women than men fled from bondage. Most enslaved women were unwilling to abandon their children in order to increase their chances of escape. Most fugitive women took their children with them. So there's a long history of the white male elite on one hand devaluing black mothers' relationships with their children, while on the other hand using the threat of child removal to control and punish black mothers. Okay, keep that in mind as I move forward uh, into our <laughs> child welfare system today. And I hope you will hear some resonances from what I just said about the way in which black children were weaponized against black mothers to make them more compliant. The rights of family were central to the anti-slavery movement. In petitions to the government, enslaved people often based their claims for freedom on the natural right to family integrity. Abolitionists also focused their condemnation of slavery on its immoral destruction of families, what they called the greatest perceived sin of American slavery. Images of crying mothers and children clinging to each other as merciless slave traders wrenched them apart were widely circulated in anti-slavery pamphlets, slave narratives, and newspapers. And I have an image of one of them right there on the screen. The Reconstruction Congress was moved to draft the 13th and 14th Amendments. Again, the 14th Amendment, the source of substantive due process that the majority in Dobbs said had no protection for reproductive freedom, right? Uh, why was it passed? The Congress was moved to pass the 14th Amendment, but both by formerly enslaved people's heart-wrenching accounts of family separation and reproductive servitude, and by the argument that the right to family integrity was inalienable. For example, Republican Senator James Harlan of Iowa advocated for the 13th Amendment by accusing slavery of causing, quote, the abolition practically of the parental relationship, robbing the offspring of the care and attention of his parents, severing a relation which is universally cited as the emblem of the relation sustained by the creator to the human family. His colleague, Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts promised accordingly, when this amendment to the constitution shall be consummated, the sharp cry of the agonizing hearts of severed families will cease to vex the weary ear of the nation. Just as contemporary reproductive servitude can trace its roots to slavery, contemporary notions of family liberty can trace their roots to black people's resistance against this form of state violence. So the Dobbs court grossly misread the 14th amendment and ignored the history by holding it provided no support for reproductive freedom. Mm -hmm. To the contrary, the Dobbs decision will intensify the denial of family autonomy and bodily autonomy 
that the reconstruction amendments were meant to eradicate. Now we can fill out the trajectory of the foundational exploitation of enslaved women's reproductive labor with the history of policies punishing black women's childbearing throughout the 20th century. Black women's historical experiences of reproductive violation helps to illuminate the intersection of laws that compel pregnancy and laws that criminalize pregnancy loss. As I stated earlier, the first laws enacted in the colonies treated black women as innately unrapeable and their children as innately enslavable. This laid the foundation for long lasting notions of black women's hypersexuality and hyperfertility. The belief that black women passed down a depraved lifestyle to their children persisted after the passage of the civil rights laws through the circulation of popular icons of black maternal unfitness like these of the black welfare queen that began uh, under the Reagan administration in the 1980s and social scientific research such as Daniel Patrick Moynihan's 1965 report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, which fueled harsh welfare and law enforcement policies, including mass sterilization of black women receiving welfare through federally funded social service programs. Those same ideas have been circulated by anti-abortion activists who claim that black women are committing a form of genocide when they have abortions. And uh, Clarence Thomas has stated this in uh, a prior concurring opinion and there's reference to it in the Dobbs opinion as well. But look at this message uh, that was put up in a billboard uh, in Soho uh, that the most dangerous place for an African-American is in the womb. Now, the anti-abortion activists who put that up wanted us to think that black women's wombs were dangerous because black women have a high, relatively high rate of abortion. Uh, but it's the exact same message that has been used to punish black women for having children, uh, that their wombs are dangerous because they produce, they pass down disadvantage to their children. And again, uh, I see that coming straight from the slavery era and the idea that black children's enslaved status is produced through the reproduction of black women. Uh, the belief that black women passed down Oh, naturally, innately, a depraved lifestyle to their children persisted after the civil rights uh, laws, as I was saying, and then into the 1990s in the prosecution of black women for being pregnant and using drugs. Uh, we started to see statements like this in by commentators uh, also some doctors helped to perpetuate this myth that black women gave birth to a peculiar type of baby, uh, this so-called crack baby that was described as an irredeemable monster who was destined to become a criminal and a drug addict and a welfare dependent. And uh, this turned the public health issue of drug use during pregnancy into a crime. And as you can see from, this is a, a, was really the beginning of my work in Killing the Black Body. And I devote a lot of that book to both contesting that image of the crack baby and the prosecutions of black women, but also pointing out how they were a devaluation, a continuum continuing the devaluation of black women's childbearing. And this, this uh, 
editorial in the Houston Post in 1990 emphasizes this idea that there is some a biological process going on that inevitably causes black children to be disadvantaged uh, and blaming their mothers for it. Of course, diverting attention away from all the structural reasons why black children are more likely to be born in poverty, more likely to die in the first year uh, and have other disadvantages like those. Over the ensuing decades, the fetal personhood movement developed a unified legal strategy of criminalizing pregnancy outcomes while shutting down abortion services. Legal theories crafted to prosecute black mothers set the stage for more widespread criminalization for fetal harm. So by 2020, more than 1,700 women had been arrested, detained, or subjected to forced medical intervention because of pregnancy-related accusations. Over the same period, state legislatures enacted fetal protection laws that criminalized pregnancy by giving fetuses the status of already born children. As states mounted legislative assaults on access to abortion, they constructed a legal apparatus to charge pregnant people criminally for putting their fetuses at risk, including for pregnancy losses. And one of the very first was the conviction of Regina McKnight for homicide by child abuse when she experienced a stillbirth. Uh, she spent eight years in prison before her conviction was overturned for ineffective assistance of counsel because her counsel did not challenge the really bogus evidence that the state put on that she had caused the stillbirth of her baby. Women have been arrested, women like Regina McKnight, both for stillbirths and for attempted abortions under the same fetal protection laws. And by eliminating Roe's protection for abortion before viability, which some courts had considered a limit on fetal abuse prosecutions, Dobbs has unleashed state power to criminalize people, pregnant people who fail to deliver a healthy baby. And the idea that people will not be imprisoned for having abortions, that it'll be doctors who are prosecuted. I mean, it's bad enough that doctors will be prosecuted, but this is evidence that women will be prosecuted and imprisoned. They're already being imprisoned for pregnancy losses. Uh, and it'll be hard to distinguish between terminating a pregnancy intentionally or having a stillbirth. Now, anti-abortion advocates have long held out adoption as a remedy for the harms of compelling people to give birth. They argue that the availability of adoption eliminates a pregnant person's obligation to raise an unwanted child and therefore serves as a substitute for having an abortion. The anti-abortion movement has installed deceptive crisis pregnancy centers throughout the nation that pressure pregnant people to carry their pregnancies to term and surrender their babies for adoption. By linking abortion to adoption, conservatives hope to make abortion restrictions seem less onerous, thereby gaining popular support for abortion bans. But liberals also have embraced adoption as a seemingly non-controversial child welfare policy that can build common ground with conservatives on the hot button issue of abortion. The adoption remedy became a significant aspect of the Dobbs decision. Some anti-abortion activists who gathered outside the Supreme Court, like this, these here, during the Dobbs oral arguments carried these signs, I will adopt your baby. And during 
Julie Rickleman's argument on behalf of abortion clinics during the Supreme Court argument before the Dobbs decision to decide Dobbs, Justice Amy Coney Barrett suggested that the burdens experienced by pregnant people who are denied abortions could easily be relieved by placing the resulting babies at safe haven uh, places uh, to go into state custody. Here's how she questioned Ms. Rickleman. So petitioner points out that in all 50 states, you can terminate parental rights by relinquishing a child after birth. Seems to me, seen in that light, both Roe and Casey emphasize the burdens of parenting. And insofar as you and many of your amici focus on the ways in which forced parenting, forced motherhood would hinder women's access to the workplace and to equal opportunities, it's also focused on the consequences of parenting and the obligations of motherhood that flow from parenting. Why don't safe haven laws take care of that problem? didn't end with the argument because Justice Alito picked up this idea in his majority opinion. He recited without any criticism anti-abortion advocates argument, quote, that states have increasingly adopted safe haven laws, which generally allow women to drop off babies anonymously, and that a woman who puts her newborn up for adoption today has little reason to fear that the baby will not find a suitable home. That's just false, but I'll go on. He then backed up this claim with a footnote that quoted a 2008 CDC report, quote, nearly 1 million women were seeking to adopt in 2002, i.e. they were de in demand for a child. Whereas the domestic supply of infants relinquished at birth or within the first month of life and available to be adopted had become virtually non-existent. In part because we had the right to abortion. The court suggested that forcing pregnant people to give birth created a win-win situation. By surrendering their babies for adoption, pregnant people could escape the burdens of parenting while meeting the unfilled demand for adoptable babies. This vision of a well-functioning market for babies conveniently omitted the physical and mental costs of gestating a fetus and the ethical problem of overriding pregnant people's autonomy over their bodies while they're pregnant. What about that? <laughs> Ignored by this option. The court considered only the burdens that arise after the compelled birth and not those that occur during the pregnancy. What's more, the adoption market imagery falsely treats the decision to surrender the baby as if it were a freely made reproductive choice when in reality, it was coerced by the inability to obtain an abortion. The court's baby market imagery also terribly mischaracterizes how the adoption system operates. Justice Alito's portrayal of the transfer of babies from birth mothers to adoptive couples as equitable transactions mask the coercive power arrangements that underlie the transfers. To begin with, pressuring people to relinquish their babies for adoption typically takes a profound emotional toll. More than 1 million US unwed women bow to enormous family and social pressures to give away their babies in the decades between World War II and the Roe decision. Many of them reported enduring lifelong emotional trauma from that experience. One woman described herself to author Ann Fessler as an illegal mother who was robbed of her child. It's as if I was an unwilling accomplice to the kidnapping of my own child, the birth mother stated. In fact, the pain of losing a newborn is so severe that people who are denied an abortion rarely surrender their babies for adoption freely. 
They may be forced to, but they rarely do it freely. Instead, compelling people to give birth to a child whom they are economically, socially, or psychologically unprepared to raise often intensifies the hardships faced by them and their families. The Turnaway study, which tracked a thousand women who sought abortions over 10 years, found that the women who were denied abortion care suffered serious physical, emotional, and economic harm. Those forced to carry unwanted pregnancies to term were far more likely to be living in poverty, undergo evictions and bankruptcies, and experience mental health problems than their counterparts who had abortions. I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that abortion is a solution to poverty, but I'm saying if you're denied an abortion, it increases the risk that you will live in poverty. The hardships abortion bans impose on people who keep their babies creates, create an avenue for family separation and coercive adoptions. In other words, yes, there may be an increase in adoptions as a result of the Dobbs decision, but it's not because people freely surrendered their babies for adoption. Uh, and let me explain how it may increase coerced family separation and adoptions. Impoverished families, especially those that are black or indigenous, are at high risk of disruption by government child protective services or CPS. Many Americans, view the child welfare system as a benign social service provider that safeguards children from abuse and neglect. But as I explain in my latest book, Torn Apart, this government regime is better described as a family policing system. It's a powerful state apparatus that intensively regulates marginalized communities by accusing family caregivers of child maltreatment investigating and monitoring them, taking away their children and permanently severing their familial bonds. Child protection agents gain their power to regulate families by wielding the threat of removing children from their homes and permanently severing the relationship to their parents and other family members. In 2020 alone, child protection agencies investigated accusations of maltreatment involving 3 million children. In cities across the nation, CPS surveillance is concentrated in impoverished black neighborhoods. In those neighborhoods, all parents are ruled by the agency's threatening presence. Whether they've been investigated or not, they're quite aware that there is an agency that's concentrated in their neighborhood that can take their children away. And all the children in that neighborhood, if they haven't been investigated, subject to an investigation, they know somebody, believe me, who has been. Most black children in America, 53% will experience a CPS investigation at some point before their 18th birthday. Let me repeat that. Most black children in America will be the subject and experience a child welfare investigation before they reach age 18. Now, either you believe something is directly wrong with black families, or you believe that something is dreadfully wrong with an institution that would investigate that many black children. And that rate is even higher in some large cities in the United States. During CPS investigations, in case you might think, well, what's wrong with being subject to CPS investigation? If you haven't done anything wrong, why not? Case workers may inspect and usually do every corner of the home. They interrogate family members about intimate details of their lives. They may strip search children outside the presence of their parents to look for evidence of maltreatment 
and they collect confidential information from schools, healthcare providers, and other social service programs. If caseworkers detect a problem like drug use, inadequate medical care, or insecure housing, they will coerce families into an onerous regimen of supervision that rarely addresses their needs, doesn't provide the housing that the family needs, gives the family a list of mandates that they have to fulfill to get their children back. More disruptive still is the forcible family separation that too often follows CPS investigations. Most of the more than $30 billion spent annually on child welfare services goes to keeping children away from their families, to keep them in foster care and for adoption assistance, not preventing child maltreatment or preventing family disruption or providing family services to intact families. Every year, child welfare agencies take more than 200,000 children from their homes and put them in the formal foster care system. At the same time, these agencies informally separate about what's estimated the same number of children from their parents based on so-called safety plans, arrangements parents are pressured to agree to in lieu of a formal court proceeding. And we don't know exactly the number because they, there aren't records of this. They don't go to court. They just are forced to sign these on the threat that they're gonna lose their children, perhaps permanently if they don't sign them. At the end of 2021, the national foster care population stood at about 400,000 with untold numbers in this shadow foster system. Black children have long been grossly overrepresented in the national foster care population. Although they were only 14% of children in the United States in 2019, they made up 23% of children in foster care. More than one in 10 black children will be taken from their families before they reach age 18. When President Trump's cruel policy of separating migrant children from their parents at the Mexican border drew national condemnation. And we saw reports that this was terribly traumatic for children and their parents and that they would suffer long lasting harm from these separations and that even violated international conventions. And one report said it was a form of torture, but few experts connected that to the far more widespread family separation that takes place every single day at higher rates in black neighborhoods. Empirical studies have documented rampant anti-black racial bias in the decisions to remove children from their home and state and US governments have wielded child removal as a measure to quell black people's rebellion against racial injustice and we can track when the foster care population exploded uh, as backlashes to the civil rights movement uh, and to uh, other advances uh, of black people in America. Uh, I'm not focusing on what happens to indigenous tribes, but we know that child removal was used as a literal weapon of war by the US military against native tribes. And then of course there was a policy, long lasting policy into the 1970s of officially taking native children from their homes to assimilate them into white uh, culture uh, through adoption. Most children in foster care were removed from their homes based on accusations of parental neglect. Only 17% of children enter foster care because they were found to be physically or sexually abused. The conflation of poverty and neglect is written directly into state statutes that define child maltreatment. Many states broadly permit intervention into families whenever parents fall short of supplying the proper or necessary support for a child's well being. A 2020 50 state survey of neglect statutes found that most are, quote, very open ended allowing child protective investigators and their supervisors to declare a child neglected based on their own unbounded opinions as to what is proper or necessary care. 
Based on the state child neglect laws, child protection investigators interpret conditions of poverty, lacking food, you know, not enough, once they don't look in, the, in cabinets in the refrigerator, not enough food in the house, insecure housing, houseless families have their children taken away all the time. It's one of the main reasons why children are placed in foster care, their families don't have secure housing, inadequate medical care. All of these are evidence of parental, taken as evidence of parental unfitness. Forcing people to give birth to children they are unprepared to care for will only increase their odds of being deemed neglectful and becoming entangled in the family policing system. But that's why they may end up being taken from their families, not because the pregnant person voluntarily relinquishes the child, that's because they have the child and then are thrown into deeper poverty and now are at risk of being considered a neglectful parent. The fate of many families separated by family policing is their legal destruction. Parents who are unable to complete agency requirements face termination of their rights. A judge permanently severs their legal relationship with their children. You know, most terminations of parental rights occur because the parent has failed to comply with some demand made by the child welfare agency and approved by a judge, not because there is some evidence that the child is gonna be harmed if they go home. It's really, they haven't completed everything they were told to do. And a recent expose just came out a couple of weeks ago about all the families whose parental rights are terminated because they didn't pay a bill that the child depart welfare department gave them for uh, keeping their children against their will. The dissolution of the legal relationship between foster children and their parents is known as a civil death penalty because it's the ultimate punishment family courts can impose. A 2019 study estimated that one in 100 US children will experience this permanent loss of family ties before they reach age 18, with the risk highest for Native American and African American children. Parental rights termination is far more common than often thought, as the study concluded. So let's remember that adoption of children, this remedy of children being adopted from foster care requires, or any adoption, requires the termination of their parents' rights. Far from being a free market transaction, then, as Justice Alito's opinion uh, implied, the availability of foster children for adoption results from a system that relies on coercion and threats the justice's promotion of adoption also elides the untold numbers of what are called legal orphans in foster care. These are children who were legally severed from their parents, but were never adopted. What happens to those children? Many of them age out of foster care. That means that they turn 18 or 21 and they are still in the foster system, those children are just dumped by state agencies. I mean, sometimes literally just left at a homeless shelter without any resources and sometimes without any connections to an adult to help them maneuver in life. And as might be expected, they're vulnerable to homelessness, poverty and incarceration. So denying access to abortion will likely increase the number of children consigned to and spit out of the foster system without any family ties at all. Oh, I missed, skip that. Okay. Just as criminalizing abortion will increase the number of children forcibly removed from their homes, so criminalizing fetal abuse will expand the grounds for family separation. Fetal neglect is 
seen as evidence of parental unfitness. So I explained before this growth of criminalizing pregnant people for neglecting a fetus or harming a fetus or not taking adequate care of a fetus, having a stillbirth or having uh, a miscarriage. It also can be grounds for involvement by child protective agencies and accusations of child neglect. Because again, if the fetus is considered a child, they now fall under civil child neglect laws as well as criminal child neglect or abuse laws. Hospital staff routinely screen certain newborns for evidence of their mother's drug use during pregnancy and report positive results to child protection authorities. Over the last 30 years, states have increasingly included prenatal drug use in their definition of child maltreatment. Despite the lack of scientific support, states began to define exposing a fetus to drugs as a form of child maltreatment or as evidence of unfitness as a parent. The number of states with parental drug use policies increased from one in 1974 to 42 states and the District of Columbia in 2016. Whether considered a crime, infliction of civil child maltreatment, or reason to question the ability to parent in the future, using drugs during pregnancy is often seen as warranting a call to child protection authorities. Most states don't have either universal drug testing or clear testing rules, nor do they have any checks on when to report positive toxicologies to CPS. So what do you think happens in this free-for-all that hospital staff, doctors, nurses can report drug use during pregnancy as child neglect, but there's no clear protocols about whether or not to do it. Well, what happens is they have wide latitude and there is lots of evidence that they make extremely racially biased decisions. Since the 1990s, numerous studies have shown that healthcare professionals report black women who use drugs during pregnancy far more readily than they report their white patients, especially wealthy white patients. Come on, you know, doctors in the room, obstetricians in the room, pediatricians. You don't report your wealthy white patients to CPS to take ba their babies away. This happens routinely with black mothers, especially impoverished black mothers. And as I point out here, the investigation by uh, the um, Civil Rights Committee of New York City hospitals, which now have stopped, uh, my understanding is they have stopped uh, anonymous, um, I should say unconsented to drug testing of uh, pregnant people. Parents who are found to have maltreated a fetus, bringing them under CPS surveillance, automatically may be put at risk of losing any children they have in the future. So compelling pregnant people to give birth will increase state removals of children from parents charged with neglecting them either in the womb or after the children are born. So in short, the Dobbs decision's denial of constitutional protection for abortion is intimately connected to state punishment of pregnancy and parenting, creating an even broader devaluation of reproductive freedom than has typically been recognized. You know, this goes far beyond banning abortion. Throughout US history, black women have experienced the brunt of these entangled punitive policies. Their experiences of reproductive servitude and family separation going all the way back to the slavery era and continuing throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century, illuminate the fallacy of the Dobbs court's appeal to adoption as a benevolent alternative to abortion, a solution for compelled pregnancy. The rhetoric of saving babies is a guise 
to justify expanding the government's power to regulate individuals, families, and communities, even beyond what is currently permitted by the criminal legal system. The veneer of benevolence obscures how these integrated reproductive violations support racial capitalism, the US system of wealth accumulation grounded in racial hierarchy and ideology. They all impose a punitive approach to meeting families' material needs. And that approach takes the place of needed social change to actually provide what families need to meet their children's needs. Adoption serves as a market-based solution for meeting the needs of children in struggling families. As I pointed out before, parental failure to provide material support for children is the main reason the state places children in foster care and makes them available for adoption. The family policing system revolves around an ideology that confuses poverty with child neglect and attributes the suffering caused by structural racism, poverty, and other inequities to parental pathologies. The government then prescribes useless therapeutic remedies in place of social change needed to eliminate those inequities. Not only does the state separate families for failing to provide for their children, but it is structured to deprive these families of the income, housing, medical care, and other resources required to meet their children's needs. In addition, the family policing system is structured to offer state resources for children only when parents have lost custody of those children. Whether resulting from forced births or forced family separation, adoption inflicts an unjust bargain. The price of receiving care for children is giving up custody of them. The relationship between adoption and lack of state support for families is exemplified by the Clinton era federal consolidation of welfare retrenchment and carceral expansion. In the late 1990s, Congress passed back-to-back -back major legislation that simultaneously intensified law enforcement surveillance of Black communities, stripped away support for struggling families, and sped their children into adoptive homes. First came the controversial Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, which imposed harsh prison sentences for federal offenses and showered states with funds to expand their police forces and build more prisons. And of course, that intensified mass incarceration of Black people in America. In 1996, Congress passed the Personal Responsibility and Work Reconciliation Act, ending the federal guarantee of cash assistance to needy families families living in poverty, and gave states wide latitude to decide how to implement extensive welfare reform policies. Welfare's purpose was no longer to provide aid to families with children. Instead, it was to coerce mothers who receive welfare to change their behaviors by getting married, taking low-wage jobs, and having fewer children explicitly stated by Congress that that was the purpose of welfare reform. Now, less attention has been paid to what happened a year later. In 1997, President Bill Clinton signed the Adoption and Safe Families Act, 1997, after directing the federal government to take steps to double the number of foster children adopted by the year 2002. ASFA, as it's called, prioritized getting foster children adopted over reunifying them with their families. It enforced a set of mandates and incentives to state child welfare departments that 
made adoption more attractive. Falsely equated permanency with adoption and loosened the requirement that agencies make reasonable efforts to keep families together. And it established swifter timelines for terminating parental rights, shifting the presumption in favor of termination when children have spent more than 15 of the previous 22 months in state custody. Again, termination, not because there was some evidence that the child would be in danger if returned home, but termination because the child had spent too much time in foster care. Why do children spend so much time in foster care? Because their parents haven't been able to meet all the requirements that the state puts on them to get their children back. ASFA also offers financial incentives to states to increase the number of children adopted out of the foster system with no comparable incentives to increase family preservation. By 2014, the federal government had handed states $424 million in adoption incentive bonuses. Yes, it gave states bonuses to get more children adopted, exceeding the amount saved in foster care costs. So the coinciding passage of these two laws, the welfare law, the adoption law, marked the first time in modern US history that the federal government mandated that states protect children from parental neglect. Of course, protecting them uh, by taking their children away from them, but failed to guarantee a minimum economic safety net for impoverished families. And again, the same racist mythology about black families such as the welfare queen and crack baby that I mentioned earlier helped to fuel these punitive bipartisan measures. When ASFA's backers argued for increasing adoptions to reduce the mushrooming foster population, black children were four times as likely as white children to be removed from their homes. And black children made up the largest group of children in foster care, even though they were a relatively small minority of children in the United States. Advocates portrayed Black families' ties as the chief impediment to permanency for children in foster care. The solution they argued was to, quote, free Black children from their mothers by permanently extinguishing their legal bonds so that they could be made available for adoption. Some transracial adoption advocates even portrayed Expedited, expedited termination of black mothers' rights as a means for facilitating adoptions of black children by white couples, whom some said would be better parents than uh, black people. ASFA dealt a devastating blow to families, especially black families. Chicago, where virtually all the children in foster care were black, felt its immediate impact According to the Chicago Reporter, by 1999, just two short years after ASFA's enactment, quote, terminations grew from 958 to 3,743 in that period, meaning that three out of every five cases ended with parents losing custody. The relationship between adoption and lack of state support for families is also illuminated by comparing abortion laws and welfare policies among states. This is uh, thanks to the New York Times and some of its fancy uh, graphics work and, and research. The states that enacted the most severe restrictions on abortion are the ones with the highest child poverty rates, the worst healthcare systems, and the fewest supports for struggling families. These same states have the highest, and this is what's shown here, the highest maternal and infant mortality rates in the nation, states that are far worse for Black people. States in the South, which have the largest share of the Black population, have especially abysmal birth outcomes. 
it is safer for black women to be pregnant in Kenya or Rwanda than in the Mississippi Delta. In short, the states that compel pregnant people to give birth and presumably rely on adoption as a remedy are the very ones that are the riskiest for black people to be pregnant. The Dobbs decision not only permits making abortion a crime, but also intensifies state punishment of pregnancy and parenting that was already expanding under Roe's regime. The court's reasoning envisions a society where adoption is forced upon politically marginalized people as a response to crises caused by racism and other structural inequities. Black feminists have long argued that reproductive freedom includes both bodily and family autonomy. We developed a reproductive justice analysis that accounts for the entanglement of abortion bans, criminalization of pregnancy, and forcible child removal. The human right not to have a child, to have a child, and to raise a child, to raise your children in safe, supported, sustainable communities have always all been central tenets of reproductive justice, always. This is a framework that is made more urgent than ever by the Dobbs decision. Rather than center on defending legal protections for the most privileged people, the reproductive justice movement centers on creating a society that meets human needs without policing pregnancy and families. We should connect activism to guarantee the legal right to abortion to the growing movement to dismantle the family policing system led by parents and youth who've been ensnared in it. These activists promote legislation to curtail mandated reporting, guarantee legal representation to parents and other family caregivers and require informed consent for drug testing. And yes, consent, informed consent uh, for drug testing of pregnant people and their newborns. They advocate for policies that shift government funds away from coercive interventions in families toward putting resources directly in parents' hands. And they're creating community-based approaches to support families and keep children safe. These approaches are gonna be all the more necessary, especially in these unfree states where pregnancy can be compelled, but necessary everywhere as we see these repercussions of the Dobbs decision that I've been talking about in, in my lecture tonight. With a common radical vision for meeting human needs and caring for each other as equal human beings, we can build a society where all aspects of reproductive violence, compelling people to give birth, punishing people for pregnancy outcomes and forcing people to surrender their children, all of those would be unimaginable. The abolitionist mission to eradicate these brutal forms of reproductive violence is more urgent today than ever. Thank you. All right, so. Excellent, now it's on. I have the difficult task of following Professor Roberts. When I was asked to do this, I thought surely five more minutes of her talking would be more productive. Mm -hmm. That being said, I'm delighted to be here. In fact, with the mention of Ropes and Gray and with Roger Allen Moore, I did not overlap with him, 
but I imagine that some of the associates that he trained probably then grew up to be partners and trained me. And I think the intersection of law, of what society is, what it could be, what it shouldn't be, and medicine is so important because it really shapes who we are and how we experience the world. When I was asked to do this, I had the same conversation that I just led with, with a mentor of mine who is a retired ob guy, saying, you know, there's going to be this amazing talk. What should, what flavor should I bring to this <laughs> stew? And he told me this story about one of his mentors that I think depending on your age, as I tell it, you might say, oh my gosh, I can't believe we have to be reminded of this story. But I think that if you're my age or younger, you may say, I have, I didn't know about this story. And I think it's especially pertinent to tell in this room because it's a story about the Boston medical community. He started telling me about one of his mentors, Dr. Kenneth Edelin, who was right as Roe was decided, the chief resident of ob at what was then known at Boston City Hospital, now BMC, who performed an abortion on, as far as I can tell, the record varies. The estimates is given somewhere between a 20 and 28 week pregnancy, generally around 24 weeks pre-viability at that point. The woman who came in was, you know, by some respects, not a woman, depending again on your age. She was 17. She was there with her mother. Her father did not know. And according to the mother was not going to approve of this, but the daughter and her mother felt that she did not want to continue with this pregnancy. This was not the choice that they both wanted. The abortion turned out to be more complicated than Dr. Edelin thought. And what was going to be a simple saline injection to induce early labor had to end up being a surgical abortion. A year later, the Suffolk County DA, who was up for re-election, but was also very much part of the Boston Catholic community that was anti-abortion pro-life at the time, filed charges for manslaughter against Dr. Edelin. The assistant DA who took it up was one of the best in the office and also very politically ambitious, later took the DA job from his boss. So I can only imagine what the relationship between those two men were like. But they prosecuted the case. And at the time, everybody was very puzzled because Roe v. Wade had been announced. And they said, surely this is legal. What he was doing was within the bounds of standard of care. We have Roe. This was pre-viability. What's the legal case there? But nevertheless, a jury that was majority Catholic, which I think at the time probably reflected some of their views on abortion, found him guilty of manslaughter. The DA's office having obtained their political victory, the judge feeling, I think, perhaps uncomfortable with the results of the jury, let him go off, quote unquote, lightly. He got a year of probation. He was allowed to keep his medical license. It was later appealed up to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, which overturned the conviction. And after that time, Dr. Elin became a big proponent for reproductive rights, served, I believe, on the board of the Planned Parenthood Federation. I bring this case up for a couple things. First of all, it really reminds me of the point of history we are now. That was a year after Roe was decided, and there was still a lot of unclaimed territory. And the anti-abortion groups really saw this as, okay, this is a good place to plant our flag because we have pictures of this fetus, which they refer to again and again as a baby boy. This plays really well for us. It also for another reason or two that I'm going to get to in a moment. And I think that's very true of the moment that we're in now on the flip side with Dobbs where there's a lot of unclaimed territory in the legal system that's going to be fought over very, very soon. And I think some of them Professor Roberts highlighted, you know, when we talk about 
self-managed medical abortions, which the WHO has put out a report saying are safe and are an entirely valid way for a woman to receive the abortion care that she needs and wants in the first trimester. I think you're going to see a lot of states start to go after women who use the internet and use websites that have physicians in other jurisdictions, maybe even outside the country, and mail them pills. I don't think it's a coincidence that I'm hearing of a lot of laws <coughs> that, you know, I guess I could be flip and say are retro, charmingly historical, but people talk about reviving the Comstock laws to say, okay, well, this is obscenity that shouldn't go through the mail. People, when they talk about, well, will women, will pregnant people have the ability to cross state lines to travel for medical care, start talking about fugitive slave <coughs> laws. And I think anytime that you're like, oh yeah, we have a legal model, it's the fugitive slave laws. That's probably a good sign that you should take a step back. And Mary Ziegler, who is an amazing legal historian, and I would say after you finish reading all of Professor Robert's books, if you're still hungry for more, she's a great place to continue, has a really great article about how both the anti-abortion and pro-choice movements were really trying to claim that space at the time that I think is really instructive of, okay, there's going to be a lot of movement in the next several years. And I think medical providers have a responsibility to really understand how is this gonna impact my clients? How is this gonna impact my medical care? The other piece of information that I alluded to why I think that the Edelin case is so important to talk about is that Dr. Edelin was black. And this was fairly notable at the time that he was chief resident. He was immensely liked and immensely well-respected. Pretty much everybody who wrote the recollections of him talked about what a fantastic doctor he was. But the case was really racialized. It was a jury that was entirely white. One of the alternate jurors later said that in the jury deliberations, the language that some of the jurors used to refer to Dr. Elin was exactly fill the blanket in your mind, extremely shameful. And when the decision was announced, the jury decision was announced, people used that language in the courtroom. And certainly that was part of it, that he was more vulnerable because of his blackness, even though he had all of the credentials, even though he was a fantastic doctor. But another component, something that I actually found really interesting that it was hidden was the race of the patient who was African-American as well. And I thought it was really interesting that it took me quite a few articles. It in fact took me until reading Mary Ziegler's more scholarly piece to find out her race. And you know, she's kind of a shadowy figure. She's remained anonymous, which I think is a good thing. She deserves not to be traumatized by what was no doubt a legal circus. So we only really have her, an understanding of her through Dr. Edelin's eyes, through the memoirs he wrote, that she was somebody who came in, that she herself did not want to be pregnant, that her mother did not want this, that after the abortion was successful, he wrote there was relief in her eyes and her composure, and that her mother also felt relief that was only marred by knowing they'd have to come up with a story to tell her father. But I was really struck by how even in the framings of this case, which is really talked about from people who are pro-choice, she really recedes in the story. That we don't know a lot about her choices, what brought her to Boston City Hospital, really anything about her except that she was 17 and she was pregnant and she didn't want to be. But one last thing that I wanna focus on before I turn it over for questions and I'm sure that you are going to grill Professor Roberts and I will happily swim like a smaller fish in her wake, is I think one thing that's so powerful about Professor Roberts' work is that she encourages us to remember that the right to reproductive self-determination is not just the right to not be pregnant. And I think oftentimes that really gets a shorthand, like, oh, like you want abortions because you want women to never be pregnant. But really the right 
to reproductive freedom, to reproductive justice, is to have the family of your choice at the time that you choose. And now I will never know what it's like to be Black in America. It's not my lived experience. But I can say that my family has a firsthand experience of the importance of being able to determine your reproductive choices when it comes to overcoming generational trauma. So my grandmother turned 13 in Auschwitz. She spent her childhood being told she was somebody who shouldn't really exist and that she's somebody who should not have children and that the state literally wanted her dead, that they sent her and her family to a place where they could accomplish those goals. She survived because of a variety of reasons. She was tall, so she didn't look like a child. That was lucky. She spoke multiple languages and they were in desperate need of interpreters. That was lucky. My great-grandmother hid her in a garbage can during one roll call and they didn't check there. That was all lucky. That obviously left a huge shadow on her life. But one thing that really brought light to her was later she survived and she met my grandfather and she was able to have two children. And now she died at a point where I was too young to ask a lot of pressing questions about her life choices. But judging from how soon the children followed after marriage and the fact there were only two, I suspect that she was able to make choices about the size of her family. And she was able to be the kind of parent that she wanted to be. In fact, after my father was born, she and my grandfather had been living in a kibbutz in a communitarian society where that was freely given. That was something they wanted. And when she had a child, she realized that she couldn't live like that because of her experience, mm -hmm. having been told you are not going to live. We don't want you to have children. She needed to have that ability to parent her children closely as opposed to have the community tell her what to do. Mm -hmm. And she was lucky enough to be empowered to say, okay, I'm going to leave because this is really important to me. And she was lucky enough to raise my father who grew up and for better or worse became a lawyer. <laughs> but at his graduation, it was so important to her to come to Harvard Law School, because I guess the theme of this is all roads lead to Boston and perhaps <laughs> Harvard. And she said, this is my revenge over Hitler, that my son is walking across this stage. And as a child, I was thought that was such like a beautiful story that she was like, so happy to have us and like so wanted to have us. But now as a parent and somebody who's continuing her legacy and, you know, looks at my kids and hopes that, you know, my daughter has her eyes, maybe my son has her sense of humor. I feel the weight and the satisfaction of saying, I'm able to have the children that I want because she survived being told you should not and being told you should not have children. And I think that some of the reproductive rights movement is separate from the reproductive justice movement really focused on, okay, there should be a right to not have children. But I think that has to be within the context of there's a right to your self-determination to have the children you want when you want and to parent them with the safety and knowledge that your community is supporting your parenting choices and not taking them away. And I'm just really grateful for Professor Robert's work, for the work of others to really center that voice and say, we lose something by focusing always on sort of the negative space. And I don't mean negative as a pejorative, I mean mm -hmm. on the freedom from, but we need to also think about the freedoms for. So I wanna say thank you for that immensely interesting, very rewarding lecture. Thank you, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your comments. So, Dorothy, sure. you should come back up. So, I, I, I realize that we are over, but I think okay. we are over because we have been so well engaged and informed by these lectures. So, if anyone has to go, no hard feelings, you're welcome to go. <laughs> uh,
But we're happy to stick around for a few minutes to take questions because I suspect there are many questions after that very thought provoking discussion. Uh, I will also keep an eye on the chat to see if any questions show up mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. So two questions over there, first on the outside, then the next spot in. Hi. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting that question gets complicated by concern that the Dobbs decision will be used to deny a right to use assisted reproduction because it seems as if many of the anti-abortion advocates uh, believe that life begins, you know, protected life protected by the constitution begins at conception and therefore uh, an embryo or even pre-embryos uh, cannot be destroyed, cannot or, or have certain rights that would limit people's ability to uh, create them or to implant them as they wish. So I believe that we can use a reproductive justice lens to uh, contest that view uh, and to contest the idea that people should not have uh, the ability to use high-tech means to have children. Now, having said that, I also think that a reproductive justice approach would have us question the amount of money and protection that do, do go to the fertility industry. Uh, that includes the lack of information that people who are engaged, especially people who identify as women uh, are, or people who have uh, eggs, <laughs> you know, that can be harvested, uh, that uh, the, the health concerns have been downplayed and there isn't enough research on the impact on people's bodies of multiple rounds of harvesting of eggs. Uh, that's one concern. Uh, we also need to think about the amounts of money that go into supporting that industry as opposed to basic medical care, basic reproductive health care. Uh, in addition, there are aspects of high-tech reproduction like genetic testing that include some uh, devaluation of people with disabilities uh, and people with differing abilities. So you know that raises a big question about gene editing and that sort of thing, but we all already there is a practice of embryo selection. And I think we as reproductive people concerned about reproductive justice should be engaged in discussions about the pressures on people to use gene editing or selection because of discrimination against people with disabilities. So in other words, what I'm saying is, I, don't, I believe that reproductive justice should support the rights of people to use high-tech means of reproduction to have children. But I also think a reproductive justice approach, unlike a pure reproductive choice approach, would be concerned about the context, the social context, the structural context of high-tech reproduction. Uh, I haven't even gotten to the issue of contract pregnancy, which also is related, and uh, the way in which people who are uh, gestators or, or birth mothers, often their rights are uh, diminished compared to those they enter into contracts with. And typically they are uh, of a lower uh, status in society 
with less ability to fight for their rights, uh, less value in their desire perhaps to keep a baby they keep, give birth to. And again, this, it's structured in a way that privileges the people who are able to pay for those services versus people who are providing the service of contract pregnancy. So those are just, you know, I could go on <laughs> with other examples. My main point is reproductive justice framework would not just look at it as let's protect the choices of privileged people to use high-tech means of having babies. It would also look at what are the structural inequities that shape who has the ability to make these decisions, how, who can afford to use these means of reproduction, and what are the health concerns involved, and in what ways does structural inequality pressure people to use certain means of high-tech reproduction that uh, end up facilitating or reinforcing those structural inequalities. I could I could go on at length about the issue of reproductive germline, you know, genetic uh, engineering or genetic modification, which is related to your question. Uh, and just in short, I think we haven't given enough ethical uh, debate and deliberation. Uh, by people who may be disadvantaged by it. Right now, most of the debate is about whether uh, it's accurate or whether uh, it's um, safe, not looking at questions of who benefits from the ability to modify the genes of future generations and how that might divert our attention from the structural inequities. In, in short, People who support it tend to have a stake in modifying genes and not a stake in changing society because they tend to be the most privileged people. That, that, you know, that there are nuances to that. I'm giving a, a shortened version of what could be you know, an hour lecture about it. But, and, and again, my main point is it deserves a lot more deliberation about the questions of social inequality, of discrimination against people with disabilities, you know, all of these questions that need to be deliberated more than I think have been in the past. Next question. I have a quick question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I answered it. <laughs> oh, hi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, one of the repercussions of Dobbs by criminalizing the behavior, the conduct of pregnant people and criminalizing pregnancy itself is that that adds a layer of surveillance because uh, now it gives the power to the government to investigate, to find, to spy on, to uh, detect people who are breaking the law. Uh, and we already have expanding state police powers to investigate crime as it is, you know, collection of DNA uh, and uh, predictive analytics and all sorts of uh, high tech means of detecting and even predicting crime. So when we add a whole layer of potentially criminal behavior, to that, it takes that apparatus of government surveillance and now imposes it on this whole realm of behavior. We're talking about what, you know, <laughs> whatever pregnant people do could be seen as potentially risky to a fetus and potentially a crime. So uh, one way of answering your question is, the whole apparatus of state surveillance to detect and, and importantly predict crime is expanded by this new realm of what 
new, but it, not really new, as I pointed out, it's been building up for decades, but now intensified. Uh, you put those two together, and that's something I think we should be very concerned about. Also, the way in which states like Texas, and there'll be more, are deputizing people, you know, just ordinary people to report on people who seek abortions and incentivizing them, allowing them to bring lawsuits, giving them bonuses for spying on people, turning them in. Uh, this idea that the government deputizes ordinary citizens to investigate, spy on, report their neighbors, uh, that is another aspect of the criminalization of abortion that we should be concerned about. And then also, as I was saying, with this overlap of criminalizing pregnancy loss and criminalizing abortion, in other words, as I said, effectively making it a crime not to produce a healthy baby if you're pregnant, that requires a lot of detection of who are the people, especially with the ability to self-manage abortions. So on the one hand, it's great that people can self-manage abortions. It's great that there's medical abortion and that it's now more available. But you know, as Carmel was saying, we don't know what will be criminalized. We don't know yet how states may criminalize the use, the distribution of these medical means of abortion and self, that allow people to self-manage abortions. And so if they are criminalized, that also opens up uh, another realm of state surveillance to detect who are using these, um, these forms of abortion. So all of that, I think, is extremely disturbing. I, I, it, to me, it signifies an expansion of the police state. And as I said, we already have a lot of surveillance of families to not only to identify who has maltreated children. And of course, as I, as I said, maltreatment is typically not providing for children's needs, but increasingly state child welfare departments are using predictive analytics. They're the same companies that are assisting police departments to predict hotspots for crime and identify who's gonna commit a crime in the future. Those companies are assisting state child welfare agencies to collect massive amounts of data and predict which children will be maltreated in the future and then alert child welfare departments to conduct an investigation. Now, as I mentioned, the fetal personhood laws that make fetal abuse a crime or a form of child neglect then also get attached to these forms of state surveillance to detect child abuse and neglect. And so uh, we see an expansion there as well. And uh, so all of this, I think we should be concerned about. Uh, what do we do about it? I think we need to alert people about the risks of criminalization. I don't think that people are aware yet of how they're at risk of being prosecuted. I think the anti-abortion movement has always been very vested in making it seem as if pregnant people won't be prosecuted. And they really, I've experienced this myself with it, the backlash against me when I pointed out that women are being prosecuted already for pregnancy losses. So why wouldn't they be prosecuted for having abortions, especially when the two look the same in many cases, especially with self-managed abortions and anti-abortion advocates are getting extremely upset. Again, the 
they, I had them say I was lying about this because they don't want it to appear that women are going to be incarcerated. Uh, they, they, they try to hide that. And so I think many people don't realize that they are at risk of incarceration and uh, that their personal information um, may be under surveillance. Uh, people have suggested, for example, that apps that track menstrual periods might be subject to state surveillance. Uh, certainly doctor's visits, uh, your mail, you know, who, who knows? Uh, but these are the kinds of potential aspects of the expansion of a police state government surveillance that could be unleashed or maybe already has been unleashed by criminalizing pregnancy and, and which means criminalizing conduct that's seen as risky to a fetus. And let me also say, as I mentioned before, you know, in answer to the question about uh, high tech reproduction, reproduction assisting technologies, if the fetus, what we now say fetus, the protection of a fetus or fetus, fetal personhood extends all the way to the moment of conception, uh, that leaves open anyone who could be pregnant in the future to government monitoring. And there have been suggestions already by some of the, you know, extremists or you know, what we used to think were extremists, but you know, to me, the Dobbs opinion is extremist, but uh, that anyone who is potentially pregnant should be under some limit limits about where they can work and uh, what they can consume because they may become pregnant and be gestating a, 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 an entity that has more rights than they do. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. So I think we have time for one question, but I want to take a question from someone who's oh, on, on the, the okay. online audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is from Russ Phillips, who directs the Center of Primary Care here at Harvard Medical School. Oh, okay. <laughs> he says, thanks for an amazing talk. The comments you made about Black children being removed from their families in large part due to the effects of poverty was very disturbing. Do we know whether there is any difference in the occurrence of removal of children from families due to the effects of poverty in the U.S.? Uh, in states that provide more resources to families oh. to address poverty in terms that's of a, food housing access. Yeah. That's a good question. And I, I don't have a good answer uh, to it. Uh, but let me just say that it does, it's something that we should look into if it hasn't been uh, researched. I'm, I'm racking my brain to, to think, have I seen a study that looks at that? Uh, I think that's an, an important question because one of my, part of my thesis is that if we had better supports for families, we wouldn't remove as many children. And I think that's true. I mean, we do know that states that have better supports for families or when policies are enacted like the relief policy during the COVID pandemic that sent checks to, or in other ways, you know, earned income credits, uh, various forms of income support for impoverished families. We know that that reduced child poverty and uh, that should reduce the numbers of children who are removed from their homes for neglect. Now, the reason why I can't say that is definitively the case is because there are also cases where states or nations that do have, and I'm talking globally, that do have strong supports for families, nevertheless have disturbing rates of child removal based on biased decisions about 
child rearing. So for example, uh, again, I don't know the numbers. I don't know that research has, has uh, conclusively determined the rates, but uh, in some nations in, that have very strong welfare, say certainly stronger than the United States, Sweden, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, uh, there have been reports of refugee families, immigrant families from, especially from Africa, having their children taken from them because of cultural differences. Um, some of the states that we wouldn't think of as having high rates of childhood poverty or uh, abysmal family supports, like Minnesota, for example. Minnesota has the highest racial disproportionality of any state in child removal. Uh, I just spoke at University of Toronto last week about child welfare policy and was told, I, I don't have the exact statistics, but very alarming statistics about the rates of black children removed from their homes. Someone said it was seven times, and again, I can't confirm this, but I was told seven times uh, more likely for a black child in Toronto to be taken from their home than a white child. So uh, San Francisco, for example, which you would think of as a liberal city, has an extremely high rate of black child removal because, this is my analysis talking with people in San Francisco, because it's extremely expensive to live in San Francisco. And most of the black people who remain in San Francisco live in housing projects where there is intense child welfare agency involvement. And so it's very unlikely that a white family in San Francisco, you know, which has relatively, will have relatively high income, will be subject to a child welfare investigation, but very likely that one of the black families in the housing projects that remain there will be investigated. So uh, I, I, I can't answer the question definitively, but I would say that while it's true that having stronger supports for families will likely reduce the removal of children from their homes for neglect, it's not the answer, the complete answer to the problem because uh, there still is, is a lot of racial or ethnic or cultural bias in decision-making about neglect. Uh, I'll just tell one quick story about um, child removal in Minnesota. I, I once uh, was working with some people in Minnesota and in looking at why there were such high rates of uh, child removal in Minnesota, especially high rates among black families. And uh, there was someone who worked with Somali refugees in uh, Minnesota and reported that a large number of children were being taken from their families after child welfare investigations. And this person I spoke with determined it was because teachers were reporting the children for neglect because they would come to school in pajamas or with meals that the teacher didn't recognize as nutritious. And the, uh, the, the lawyer I was talking to who represented some of these families said that the families explained that when they came to Minnesota, they were given pajamas. Most of the clothes they were given were pajamas and they thought that's what you were supposed to wear. But teachers interpreted that as child neglect. So uh, whether Minnesota, you know, I don't think of Minnesota, it's probably has a pretty robust child welfare uh, uh, policies in terms of supporting families. I don't know for sure. I would imagine they're better than in Mississippi and some of the Southern states, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's protect, absolute protection against child removal. So uh, it's complicated, but definitely better to have strong supports for families.
Yes. Oh, can, so, can I say one more thing? Okay, but then we have to cut it off. Okay, all right. One more thing. One more thing. I, I want to give this example, um, which is in partial answer to the question of uh, um, Anna Ahrens. Uh, she's a professor at, clinical professor at NYU, and she wrote an interesting article on the unintended abolition of the child welfare system in New York City during the COVID lockdown. Uh, during the COVID lockdown, child welfare investigations plummeted drastically. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of prediction that children were going to be abused in their homes. Also children were spending a lot more time at home and fear that abuse rates were gonna go up. But in fact, they did not go up. They didn't go up in New York City and, and at least one national study has found that they didn't go up nationally as, as well. And Professor Ahrens argues that the reason they didn't go up and children were safe, if not safer in their homes during the COVID lockdown without all these investigations and child removals was because there was an outpouring of mutual aid and families were receiving uh, resource material, you know, goods and resources that they needed. And also because families were getting this additional income as a result of the COVID relief packages. So uh, that's, again, small study, not, uh, uh, it requires more research, but we do have evidence that providing direct concrete support for families can keep children safe. And my overall argument about it is why continue a system that we know harms children? I didn't even go into all the harms of being in foster care, well-documented. Uh, when we know that there are better ways of supporting families that where there is evidence reduces child poverty, reduces the material needs of families uh, and can keep children safer. And, and thank you for that story, which with, with obviously the, the talk, there are a lot of huge challenges before us as a society and many yeah. problems that need to be addressed, but there are avenues of hope and, and things that can be done yes. to, to fix things going forward. And it's always important to remember that yes. to motivate people to do the work that will need to be done going forward. So thank you all for your attention. I apologize for running over, but again, it was Sorry. a tribute to the interest of the talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much.